The word corset has dramatic associations for many of us. Torture devices, cruel tools of patriarchal oppression, a cage to keep women frail and weak. Well, I'm here to tell you the truth. My name is Tilda. I've been making and wearing corsets and their less famous cousin stays for about seven years now. I have yet to faint, dramatically expire, break a rib, develop regressive opinions, or permanently shift my internal organs around. Women's support garments, for that is exactly what these are, get a very bad rap, and in this video we're going to sit down and discuss exactly why that's unfair. Corsets, and their earlier counterparts, stays and pairs of bodies, were garments that were worn by women to support their busts, their backs, and to help smooth out their figures to create the correct, fashionable silhouette of the day. They did the same job that bras and shapewear do now, although some may argue they did it more effectively. Except in extreme cases, which are much dramatised by people nowadays, their main goal was not in fact to reduce the waist. Bone support garments were worn from the late 1500s into the 1900s, and they are still in use today, albeit in costuming, high fashion and evening gown capacities. For us cosplayers, it can be important to identify which era a garment like this is from in order to recreate it, but also to capitalise on its usefulness as part of costumes which aren't even historical. In the late 16th century, we begin to see the emergence of a heavily boned garment known as a pair of bodies, or simply bodies. I unfortunately cannot include an image of them here. The earliest known pair are in the Bayerisches National Museum in Munich and date from around 1598. I've included my own sketch of them, but you can find them by searching Dorothea Sabina von Neuburg bodies. The next and most famous pair are from Elizabeth I's effigy and can be found with a quick search of Elizabeth I effigy pair of bodies. This particular pair is from 1603. Prior to this invention, women's busts were supported by the heavily stiffened bodices of their kirtles, a type of gown come bodice petticoat, which was fastened by being laced closed. The bodice would be stiffened by layers of linen buckram that had been sized, which means stiffened with animal glue. This first pair of bodies is almost fully boned, with the exception of the bust area which is divided by a busk and features unboned U-shaped sections for the breasts. They lace up at the back and have fixed shoulder straps. The effigy bodies show us a garment that is far longer in the waist than both the Dorothea bodies and the stays that came after it, echoing the style of gowns from this era which have a serious dropped waist. They are fully boned and have shoulder straps that are attached to the high back and tie on at the front. They also have tabs much like the later stays. The name pair of bodies comes from each side of the garment lacing together to form one garment, thus it is a pair of. This naming convention continues as pairs of bodies become pairs of stays, even when the stays are one piece. Rather swiftly, bodies became known as stays. This remained the case throughout the 17th, 18th and early 19th centuries. It has been suggested that we get stays from the French term estaya, to support. There is also a theory that each separate bone was considered a stay, thus stays. There's a lot of variation in stays over this long stretch of time, especially when we get to the 19th century, but for much of the 17th and 18th centuries, they were heavily boned conical garments that aimed to create a smooth cone-like shape for the dresses of the era to sit smoothly over. They did not aim to reduce the waist or crush the body. For much of the time stays were in fashion, it was fashionable to push the breasts up to create a kind of shelf. This is where we get the heaving bosom stereotype from. Stays typically are at their narrowest point at the natural waist, after which they separate into tabs which distribute the pressure of the garment and the weight of any skirt supports and skirts over the hips. In the 17th century they often featured off the shoulder straps, some had sleeves which tied on. In this period stays were more likely to be worn as a visible element of an outfit, either by poorer women as a completely visible element or by richer women with the front visible providing a decorative focal stomacher element to a gown. As in the first example I showed here, there was little distinction between bodices and smooth covered stays at the time, and you'll see both in portraits on women of all classes. Whilst some earlier examples of stays have fixed shoulder straps, later examples from the 18th century are strapless, and yet more have adjustable straps that tie to the stays at the front. Although they had moved around for the entire century, during the late 18th century, particularly the 1780s through the 1790s, the waists began to subtly but consistently shift higher with the waistlines of gowns, until we end up with the empire line look we are familiar with from the early decades of the 19th century, known as the Regency era. 
Regency era stays are characterised by their lack of boning, their stiff central busks and their gentle curves. Instead of boning, the structure of these garments comes from cording, quilting and stitching. The waist is always a gentle curve sitting at the natural waist, even when the waistline of gowns comes in just under the bust. It is here we begin to see gussets lending them curves over the hips and to accommodate the bust. It was fashionable to lift and separate the breasts. The central busk made sure to encourage good posture and aid in holding the breasts apart. Regency stays tend to be fairly long, coming down to the high hip, although there are short examples that focus simply on supporting the bust as well. This is where stays begin to gradually transition into corsets, however the word stays is still used well into the 1840s and 50s, until it phases out in favour of the term corset. We get the word corset from the French word for body, corps. Throughout history, it has been fashionable to borrow terminology from the French, and this is one such example. The term initially pops up in England in the 1780s, used by writers to describe a French garment, like a quilted waistcoat without any stiffening called un corset. This sounds like a description for a garment known as jumps, which has been the more generally accepted term in historical costuming communities for years. However, it's impossible for us to reliably confirm when corset was in use or when jumps was in use. After the 1830s and into the 1840s, stays become more commonly referred to as corsets as the terminology shifts, with less boning than their 18th century counterparts and more structure than their Regency predecessors. Essentially, they have become the garment we think of today when we hear the word corset. Over this century and into the 20th century, they will change a lot, sometimes multiple times a decade, varying in proportions, materials and shape. At the beginning of the century, we see less dramatic curves, shorter lines and corsets in one piece that, excepting some rare pieces, lace closed in the back. In the 1860s, we begin to regularly see the split busk, invented in the 1850s, which revolutionised corsets. In the latter half of the century, they become even more highly complex pieces of engineering, their ability to mould and support the body coming from the shape of the pattern pieces, with the boning there to give support to this clever manipulation through fabric. The invention of spiral steel bones eventually allows for more extreme curves and harder wearing garments. The turn of the century brings the famous S-bend corset, although I will emphasise that the extreme silhouette made famous by Gibson girls was achieved through clever padding more than it was ever achieved by contorting the body. These corsets are very long and lean, slowly transitioning into the long line underbust styles of the 1910s. This is the last decade we associate with proper corsets. The 1920s brought new styles which didn't call for them, and whilst I'm certain women still wore them, they slowly transformed into cinches and girdles, and eventually the spandex shapewear we use today. This is by no means an exhaustive list of examples. There are so many of these garments, it would be impossible to show you all of them. There were stays and corsets for sports, nursing, fetish wear, corsets made simply from strips of ribbon, soft quilted jumps made for lounging in bed or wearing around the house, the list goes on. Now that we've established the difference between pairs of bodies, stays and corsets, let's talk a little bit about what they're made from. For much of their history, bone support garments were made from sturdy linen canvas, optionally covered with another fabric such as silk, wool or linen. However, in the 19th century, we begin to see corsets made from lighter fabrics, drill and cotton canvases, and in some cases, ribbon. Bodies and stays were boned with reed and whalebone. Not actual whalebone, but baleen, which is essentially whale's teeth. Throughout history, they have had wooden, ivory and bone busks, the stiff core of support at the centre front point. Eventually, corsets were boned with both flat and spiral steel, although whalebone was still very much in use. Wooden busks were replaced by split steel busks, which far more easily allowed women to put their corsets on without help, although putting them on alone wasn't impossible before. At different points, cording, Quilting and decorative stitching have all been used to help lend structure to these garments. So what do we use now? Well, it's entirely possible to use truly historical materials, with the exception of baleen, of course, for obvious reasons. <laughs> Nowadays, cotille is very commonly used for both corsets and stays, in combination with a huge range of top fabrics. It can be both cheaper and harder wearing than some historical fabrics, although there are advantages and disadvantages to both. My stays are actually lined with cotille. My favourite material for boning is reproduction whalebone. This is a form of plastic boning made to replicate many of the features of real baleen. It is thin and lightweight, you can stitch through it, you can trim it into narrow strips, and like real baleen, it will form to your body over time with body heat and wear. This is appropriate for bodies, corsets and stays. My stays, seen here, are boned with reed, which I believe is a dried out water reed stalk. This works well, but they don't cope with hard wear as they can start to break. 
Many people use zip ties as a cheap alternative when making fully boned stays. For corsets you can use flat steels, although I wouldn't necessarily recommend them for every project, spiral steels, plastic boning and reproduction whalebone. I would steer very clear of Rigoline. It isn't proper boning at all. It's plastic filaments bound together with nylon thread and it's virtually useless. The section you've all been waiting for, I'm sure. We hear so many stories coming out of Hollywood, actresses fainting or living off of soup. All we hear of from this quarter is the discomfort brought on by wearing bone support garments. But how could women have been wearing them for centuries if they're so torturous? Well, the answer is rather simple. Horror stories about corsets sell. They make for sensational press, so people talk about them. Let's go through some common corset facts that are in fact myths. Tight lacing. While it can't be denied that some women did practice tight lacing, which is the act of lacing the corset very tightly to drastically reduce the waist, this was largely impossible until the Victorian era, and during the era itself, very rare. It was sensationalised and fetishised by some men at the time, and these are the records that have persisted, along with doctored photographs and inaccurate theorising from reform doctors who argued against corset wearing. The women who did choose to tight lace were generally women who had the luxury of leading sedentary lives. They were royals, aristocrats, heiresses and famous actresses. Women who didn't have to work, manage a home or look after children. Rib removals. False. Totally false. Do I even have to say it? People live their lives wearing these garments. Women of all classes, from the very poorest performing backbreaking labour whilst wearing them, factory workers, maids who were cooking and cleaning all day, women who worked on farms, harvesting grain, caring for animals. Women who owned their own businesses, milliners and mantua makers, and later women who owned fashion houses. Women who ran their own households, living the busy, privileged lives of socialites. And then there were the outliers, sportswomen, explorers, singers, performers, sex workers. These garments were as common as bras. How could women have lived their lives if they were constantly keeling over? The answer is that they couldn't have. So how should these garments feel? Well, people often describe them as feeling like a hug. There should be a gentle pressure on your torso. I have never worn bodies, but I imagine they're incredibly similar to stays. Stays tend to uniformly hug the body with slightly more pressure on the waist. The tabs help channel this outwards so that they don't cut into your waist. Your breasts are lifted and supported, gently pressed flat from the front, and you tend to breathe from higher up in your chest. Depending on the fit of your stays, they can encourage your shoulders to sit further backwards and help correct your posture. It's tricky to slouch, but not impossible. I have worn these stays for whole days, running around London at conventions, cutting out fabric on the floor and sewing. They're incredibly comfortable. Stays are particularly good for back support and good posture. Regency stays are impossible to tight lace. That's the most important thing to remember about this garment. They were worn during a period when the natural waist wasn't seen at all. Gowns fell from just beneath the bust, or at their lowest, a couple of inches above the natural waist, so there was no need to reduce its size. Instead, they focus on smoothing out the figure, supporting and separating the bust, and encouraging good posture. These stays are soft and comfortable, although it is difficult to slouch. This pair is slightly small for me, as they were originally made for someone else, but even so, my breathing isn't restricted and I'm perfectly comfortable. My bust is essentially cut, and the pressure on my torso is very slight and uniform. These don't nip in drastically at the waist, so there's no greater pressure here than there is anywhere else. The corset I'm wearing was made using an 1890s pattern, and I wanted to create a slightly more drastic waist reduction than would have necessarily been the norm at the time. Something that is true for all Victorian corsets is that the pressure is concentrated on the natural waist. They do not compress your bust, your ribs, or your hips. In fact, these areas are often quite loose. This is partly to allow the fat that you shift from your waist when you cinch it down to any degree, somewhere to go. Often these areas will have padding stitched into them to help lift and support the bust, and in the case of the hips, to help fill them out and create a more drastic difference between the hip measurement and the waist measurement. Like with my stays, I breathe higher up in my chest than I may naturally. Some people naturally breathe up here, however I had a lot of singing lessons as a child, and my stomach tends to move more when I breathe than my chest does. Despite this though, I'm not uncomfortable. It isn't restricting my breathing in any way, it's just changing how I do it. Again, slouching is tricky, but not impossible. And when you bend, you tend to bend from the hips more than you do from the waist, which is true for any of these garments. 
As I said before, I went for a slightly more drastic waste reduction with this corset because I wanted to, but historically, the average waste reduction would have been between 0 inches to 2 inches. Yes, you heard that correctly, nothing to 2 inches, and 2 inches is very achievable. Obviously, some women were just using their corsets to help support their bust, and to smooth out the lines of their figure so that their dresses sat nicely over it. A lot of the extreme silhouettes of the latter 19th century were achieved through padding, essentially tricking the eye to make the waist appear smaller. Overall, I feel confident doing very nearly anything in any of these garments. I think the only thing I'd be nervous about would be swimming, but then historically people didn't try to swim in bone support garments either, so I think that's okay. The purpose of a corset, or a pair of bodies, or stays, is to help create a good base for a gown to go over. Often these dresses had metres and metres of fabric in them, especially in the skirt. Corsets and stays took that weight. Instead of having the waistband of your panniers digging into the soft skin of your waist, it was supported by the tabs of your stays. This is why they're still useful nowadays for us cosplayers. Corsets are used in many different forms of costuming, they don't necessarily have to be historical. Amelia Clarke and Sophie Turner both wore corsets underneath their costumes in Game of Thrones, for example, and celebrities wear them underneath evening gowns on the red carpet. I sincerely hope that this video gave you the tools to go out and search for inspiration, references, materials, patterns and ready-to-wear pieces to help with your own projects. If you have any burning questions, please come find me at Wood Smoke and Words on Instagram and TikTok, and Wood Smoke Words on Twitter. I'll also be doing a Q&A right here on this channel at the beginning of May to answer any other questions you may have. Thank you for watching.